good morning, church. If you could please see the worship with us this morning.
so many different ways. He's given us his word that just tells us all of that if we look into it. But he demonstrates it through his actions. When you look how he created us in his own image and has loved us through the centuries and, and he had to send his son into this world to save us from our sins by asking him to die on the cross, a cruel death, to suffer through life and then rise from the dead, showing us what we have. He has given us his Holy Spirit to live inside of us, to guide us, direct us, to comfort us, to do so many things for us. And God always demonstrates his heart, his love through his action. And that's what we need to do, to just demonstrate our love, our response to God's love in action, in what we do. And that's what worship is about, to sing the songs, to say, you know, I love you. Because God is, says it, but mostly shows it. We talk to him, we listen to him. Lord, we're going to take the cup of love to show him that we believe what he has done for us through his son, that we accept it. But we also give to him because he has given to us it's action that shows our love that shows what's going on inside of our heart how we feel and that's how powerful our worship should be not just here but how we live our lives all that should show people we love our god who has loved us who's died for us who's created us who's done everything for us so as we worship this morning let's keep that in mind he deserves all that we can give actually more than we can give and that's why he's given us the holy spirit so let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We have the privilege of being here, to be able to worship you, to be in your presence as your children. And we just, as we worship this morning, may your love fill us, that we can show your love wherever we may be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. Hey, Lord, I see you all the time out here on the stage, but I never get a chance to talk with you. I'm I just curious, have a question here before I get started. In that. Is there anything new or exciting happening in your life? Nothing exciting that I know. Nothing exciting that you know of? Okay, let me ask you this. Is there anything new happening in your life? Oh, well. How about your family's oh, life? Okay. Well, our son Tim got engaged last week to Brandy. Oh, it, he decided to propose to Brandy, not Lisa? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. He even I'm, got her a ring. Uh, he got her a ring, huh? That is outstanding. I love it. I love it. If you see them today, you know, sitting out here with it, I mean, where's he? Oh, he, we there. can point. He's right over there. He's pointing right back. You know, congratulate them. You know, we've been praying for this day for, what, 365 days, Brandy? At least. Double. Double that? Okay, you know, so thing. <laughs> Yesterday was Lauren's birthday. He said not to mention that. So uh, you never know what's going to happen when you come to church. And we're glad that you're here definitely with it. Those watching online, thanks for tuning in uh, with us definitely. Uh, before I dive into just a couple things I want to let you know about, uh, this Thursday uh, is what our nation has set aside called the, a National Day of Prayer. And people are asked all around to be praying for our nation, praying things going on. And so what we're going to do, we, meaning the churches of the Waynesville Sherman uh, area, we're going to be coming together on Thursday night at 7 p.m. at Living Faith Baptist Church in Sherman to have a community prayer service. So just like we did our Good Friday community service, we're coming together for this prayer service at 7 p.m. this Thursday. Thursday at Living Faith Baptist Church there in Sherman. You're invited to come out and to join us that evening uh, for a time of what we need. You know, we need prayer for so many different things for our nation and everything. And so I invite you to put that on your calendar and join us uh, that Thursday, definitely. And also uh, a week from today, uh, as you know, is Mother's Day. I encourage you to invite your moms and everything to come and to be with you. Or if your mom has a church, Go be with your mom at her church, uh, you know, and spend that time and celebrate and, and, uh, and be thankful for them. But, uh, you know, that'll be next Sunday. Just wanted to let you know I can't think of a better way, a better gift to give your mom and sit and, and be in church uh, when, and celebrate Christ and who he is, definitely. Um, so last week we started this series about warning signs and, uh, and what that means with us. And I, I'm sure some of you over the years have seen, watched TV, and you've seen some of the wildfires that will be burning, you know, on the West Coast and stuff like that. And when Melinda and I, when we lived in Southern California, there was one in the San Bernardino Mountains particularly that hit, and you'll see a picture there with it. We'd drive home during the day and you'd see the smoke up there. We were in the foothills of what's called Mount Baldy. That's that peak that's right up there where you see on that, that one picture where it's just the smoke and stuff like that. 
like that, you could see that burning and this fire that was coming. And then, you know, we'd be sitting and we'd watch in the evening, you know, you'd see those, uh, the news and, and all that would be there. And you'd see that cast on there and watch this fire and everything. And, and it was kind of, kind of weird because at Mount Baldy, that's where I used to take the kids and we'd go up there at Mount Baldy hiking and stuff when, when wintertime would be there and, and be covered with snow, we'd go up there and, you know, go sledding and, and, and all that kind of stuff. And to see this fire and, and see it destroying all this area that I'd been to, you know, it was kind of like, wow, an eye opening. But, but the thing is, is I was sitting and watching TV shows. I'd be seeing these news articles or not news articles, but news shows, you know, showing that stuff. There were people that literally lived right there in the mountains and they're watching the same thing I am. They're watching this fire that's just out their back door coming at them and, and, and stuff. And actually, sadly, in that particular fire at that particular time, over two dozen lives were lost. And when they interviewed the people that were working, when they interviewed the people that were, were serving and trying to help out the police officers and the firemen and everything, one gentleman uh, named Sergeant Conrad Grayson, uh, you could tell he was frustrated as you listened to his words, as you listened to the interview, and, and almost angry to the people. This is what he said. We begged people to leave. We begged people, and they didn't take us seriously. They want to pack up some clothes like they're going on vacation. They thought they could fight the fire in the backyard with a garden hose and do it themselves. I mean, you would think if you're sitting in front of your TV seeing that shot, knowing that that's in your backyard, or you see a police officer or a fireman, you know, and they're knocking on your door, you can smell the smoke from the fire, you see the ash landing, and you'd think that would be a warning enough for you that you need to step up, that you needed to start taking action, right? I mean, all of us sitting here, it's like, yeah, if I saw that kind of fire, if I opened my front door and that's what was in front of me, I'd be going out the back door, you know, we'd want to take action, but... Also, if we got real honest here about how we respond, it seems like in our lives, really, you know, we actually are more slow to responding to things than, than, than we want to say. You know, we, we think a lot of the times kind of like those people, you know, I've got time. I've got time. You know, I've got time to pack a few things. I've got time to go get that computer, that laptop, that TV, that picture. You know, I've, I've got pretty good water pressure. I've got a pretty good size hose. I can fight this. I can do this on my own. And we think that, you know, that even though there's this warning, everything's going to be okay. It's going to be all right. So we're slow to respond. And we said, as we learned last week, and it's the truth today, you know, uh, other people can see the warning signs in our lives, you know, and, and you know, we, we can see somebody else, you know, that they need to take action. But when it comes to us, when it comes to us in our own lives, we can be pretty stubborn, can we not? we can be pretty slow sometimes to respond. And like I said, last week we talked about how God will use those warning lights on our dashboard. And I talked about the warning lights like check engine light that come on the dashboard of a car. He'll do that in our life and our walk and our journey with him. They have these little flash on say, you need to pay attention to this now because if you don't pay attention to us now, it could cost you dearly down the road. And today I want us to continue talking about warning signs, but even not so much the warning signs that are there, but, but how we respond to those warning signs. And, and, and as we go through today, and actually as we go through this whole message, one of the things I'm hoping you're doing as you're sitting here is, is God's working on your heart, and you're taking some time, and, and as you're hearing God teach and, and, and do this, you're, you're thinking, well, maybe, maybe is God trying to show me a warning sign right now? You know, maybe take some time to think, is there something going on in my life with a relationship, with a friendship, with a marriage, with a parent, with a child? Well, I don't know that there's this warning sign flashing and I haven't been paying attention to. I think I have more time than I do. And maybe God's trying to teach me something and encourage me some w w w in, in my life, you know, and maybe I need to step it up and pay more attention to it. So I want to take some time today and, and look at what can uh, save us some heartache and actually bring us some blessings if we understand these warning signs. I want to take a look at a guy named Eli. We're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 2, but I want to take a look at this guy named Eli. It might not be that popular to a lot of people, but Eli was a priest for over 40 years. So Eli knew God's commands. Eli knew God. Eli understood. And actually, he knew the warning signs. A lot of the times, God used Eli to deliver the warning signs to the people of Israel. But there's something at this particular point we're going to be reading about in Eli's life. Eli actually has a fire coming to his own house, to his family. And even though Eli knows the warning signs, even though Eli is aware of the warning signs, for whatever reason, he's not heeding them. He's not paying attention to the warning signs in his life. So we pick up in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12. It says this, Eli's sons were wicked men. They had no regard for the Lord. Okay, now Eli was a priest, and because his family and his family line, because his, his children born into it, the men born into it would also be priests, meaning they would be the spiritual leaders of Israel. 
But it, that verse doesn't make them sound like very good spirit. You know, listen, you know, they had no regard for the Lord. And it's just like, they, like it wasn't like they were pastors that didn't want to come to church. All right. It's a pretty bad scenario, a pretty bad case that's going on here. In verse 22, I love the message paraphrase, how it paints the picture of what's happening. It says this, by this time, Eli was very old. He kept getting reports on how his sons were ripping off people and sleeping with the women who helped out in the sanctuary. So you have this older priest who's been serving God for 40 years, and he keeps getting report after report after report of these other priests and the bad things that they're doing, but they're just not other priests. These are his sons. And if you keep reading, it says, okay, Eli decides to finally do something. And as you're reading along, you're thinking, great, you know, he's going to lower the boom on him, you know, he's going to whatever, and you know, he's really going to hit him hard with it. And, 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 and this is what he says. He walks into his sons and he says, what's going on here? Why are you doing these things? I hear story after story of your corrupt and evil carrying on. Oh, my sons, this is not right. These are terrible reports. I'm getting stories spreading right and left among God's people. If you sin against another person, there's help, God's help. But if you sin against God, who's around to help? So stop. And that's it. And you're like, that's it? You're just, I mean, that's a good place to start, but you're leaving it. You're just giving them a good talking to? That's all you're doing with these boys of yours and what they're doing and what, how they're defiling God? I mean, if you ever watch the show Super Nanny, I don't know if you've ever seen that, she would, she would say that you're nothing but a threatening parent. That's what she would call Eli, a threatening parent, a parent who is always saying, well, next time, next time when that happens, even though this is the 10th time it happens, but next time when that happens, this is what I'm going to do. And if you don't do something different, you know, I'm just going to, but he doesn't, that's all. He just gives them this good talking to. And verse 25 says, this is their response. But his sons were far gone in disobedience and refused to listen to a thing their father had said. So it was too late for just a good old talking to. There needed to be more action taken. And because Eli didn't, then some warnings start to come his way. In verse 27, God says to Eli, why do you treat your sons better than me? turning them loose to get fat on these offerings and ignoring me, then popping down to verse 31. Be well warned. It won't be long before I wipe out both your family and your future family. So there's going to be some long-term consequences that are going on here. So God warns Eli, hey, the fire's there. (laughs) You can not only smell the smoke, you can see it. You've got the fire at your house. You need to do something, but he doesn't. And if you go over to the next chapter, then God starts to speak to Eli and and, and the people through another prophet named Samuel. And this is what God says to Samuel. Listen carefully. I'm getting ready to do something in Israel that's going to shake everyone up and get their attention. The time has come for me to bring down on Eli's family everything I've warned him of. So warning has been there. God has had those flashing signals before his family, okay, before him. Every last word of it, I'm letting him know that the time's up. I'm bringing judgment on his family for good. He knew what was going on, that his sons were desecrating God's name and God's place, and he did nothing to stop them. He did nothing. I've warned and warned and warned and warned, and he chose to do nothing. See, there's, there's one thing I, I kind of believe about Eli's heart, and, and that when Eli started 40 years before this priest and in the ministry, I don't believe this is where Eli wanted to go. I don't believe this is the direction he wanted his life and his family and his ministry to go. I don't think this is what he wanted to happen, but it happened. And, and last week I introduced a question is, you know, and making sure, are we able to see the warning signs and, and making sure that we can see the warning signs. But I think looking at this, because Eli was very, very, you know, it says here, and it's very clear that Eli knew what was going on. The warning signs were very clear in his life, so he saw the warning signs. And if we're honest, a lot of the times we'll see the warning signs ourselves because we're imperfect people in an imperfect world. We make mistakes, and so God's promise is, you know, when we turn to him, he's going to try to keep us on that path, that right path. So these warning signs are going to be there. Maybe a better question and a more powerful and truthful question we need to ask ourselves is, uh, is what are we going to do you know how are we going to respond because these warning signs are a call to action they're a sense of urgency we need within our life 
So I want us to take a look at Eli's life and see how familiar it is with our life today and and to consider what keeps us from really responding to these warnings. Is it the same thing that kept him? Is it still keeping us today? See, uh, one of the things is Eli, he wasn't just a priest. He was also a judge. Those are two pretty heavy positions to hold. And usually separate people held them. But for whatever reason, Eli was a priest and a judge. And you know what that meant? That meant he was busy. His docket was full. I mean, it's one thing to be a priest and have a busy schedule and to judge to be a busy schedule, but to be a priest and judge, I mean, you got a full plate. You're busy, 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 constantly dealing with all these different issues coming at you. Sound familiar? It's the same things that we say today and how we relate and how we look at our life and how, how busy that we get within our life. And, and, and we have these warning signs that might be flashing up. Maybe it's our spiritual life, our family life, whatever it may be. And we see these lights, but we're really busy. So we kind of respond the same way that Eli responded. We, we do something called procrastination. You know, we procrastinate. And, that, and I heard somebody say this about procrastination once. They said, procrastination is a lot like a credit card. It's a lot of fun until you have to pay the bills, you know, and that's the truth with procrastination. So here's what we do. And here's what we say to God. You know, we, we see the flashing lights. We know that they're there and we say, hey, God, I'll get to it. I see it's there. I understand. I know it's there. I believe it's there. I'll get to it later because right now my plate's full. You don't understand how busy I, I mean, this is the busy season at work. This is whatever. I got this with the kids. I got all these hobbies. I got, right now I'm busy. My family's busy. My life, my, my, God, I see it. And we excuse ourselves because we say, we think we dealt with it when we say, I'll get to it later. And we do exactly what Eli did. Absolutely nothing. And so that's called procrastination. And we're all, we all struggle with this. I mean, if, if, if you were to let me come into your house, your garage, your basement, uh, maybe not all of you. Uh, some of us are much, much better. Some of us are not procrastinators like others. But for many of us, I could probably walk in and, you know, could I find a project or two that you've been meaning to get to for a while? Maybe something you've been trying to organize, a room, a closet, an area that you've been trying to organize for some time, but yet how does it keep getting more disorganized and there seems to be getting more stuff in there when I keep saying I need to organize this and what do we say to ourselves? I mean, how does it get that way? It gets that way simply one day at a time because what do we say? It's the same thing. I'll get to it later. I'll get to it later. You know, we procrastinate with it. Now, I realize... I realize that there may be some very important things going on in your life, some very spiritual, powerful ministries that you have to deal with that are more important than cleaning out a closet, okay? I'll give you that. There may be those times you have to serve. But I also guarantee you those things aren't happening 300, you know, well, they're not happening 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. We just keep putting it off, putting it off. We procrastinate. And so we need to ask ourselves, what is it going to take for us to listen to and to pay attention to the warning signs that the Holy Spirit is bringing on us. Because you see, again, like I just said earlier, that's the role of the Holy Spirit. Remember, when God says when we turn to Him, we give our lives to Him, He gives us the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter that's going to be there to guide, lead, and direct us through our lives, right? To help us understand. So it's the Holy Spirit that's like, oh, when we start to get off track, here come these warning signs, here comes these flashes. Hey, sharp turn her head, you know, pay attention to what you're doing. You're about to make a big, it's the Holy Spirit that's doing this. And there's something I want you to understand. If you don't hear anything else I hear today, hear this one thing. The Holy Spirit, when he's directing, when he's putting out that that warning sign, Never, ever, 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 you get in the clue, never, ever uses the word tomorrow, not once. Doesn't even think about using the word tomorrow. When the Holy Spirit puts out the warning sign, it is never tomorrow. It is always today. Today is the day. Remember Hebrews? Today is the day of salvation, not tomorrow, not next week, not next month. Don't harden the hearts, but we procrastinate. And again, it's not that we don't care. We just think we have time to get to it later. And another response that's pretty common that Eli dealt with, which we deal with, is denial. We look at it, and you know, and and, ah, it's not going to be that bad. You know, what what happened to them isn't going to happen to me. Yeah, I know the house is three houses down, burned, but that fire's not going to come down here. The wind's going the other way. The wind won't change direction and bring it. So we go into denial. And Eli, you know, 
He doesn't do anything about his sons. Even though he knows what's going on, he's getting report after report. But eventually it reaches the point where he has to address it. But when he addresses it, did you hear how shocked he sounds? What is going on here? Like he didn't know what was going on because he was trying to be in denial that he knew that he understood. And here's a simple definition of denial. Denial is failure to recognize. That's what denial is, failure to recognize. In, in, in talking about our walk and our relationship with God, it's refusal to acknowledge the warning of God within your life. And the reason we go into denial, the reason we like denial is because we don't want to see the warnings. Because if we know, if we, if we see the warnings, it's going to call us to do something we probably don't want to do. It's going to call us to change some things that maybe we don't want to change within our lives. It's going to call us to maybe accept something as not being a reality that really is a reality and a truth. Several years ago, I was at home working and <clears throat> sitting on my laptop, I was upstairs and I don't even remember what I was working on, but all of a sudden a little messenger box popped up and it was Steve, my buddy Steve. And, and you know, pops up and down there, Steve says, hi Dave, how are you? I was like, wow, I haven't heard from Pete in a long time. And I tell him, hey, Pete, doing really good. How's it going with you? Ties back, not so well. Oh, man, sorry to hear. Well, what's happening? Well, I'm overseas, and I got mugged last night, and they stole my wallet, my ID, and all my money, and I'm sitting here in the police station, and I need some help. Whoa, dude, sorry to hear. Okay? Now, some of you, you're already smiling. You're already like, yeah, you already know where I'm going with this and what this is. I didn't at that point. Okay? I, I'm still believing this is Steve and this is the reality, not a scam. Some of you are way ahead of me on this and, and stuff. And, and I'm like, whoa, because you see, and I had a little bit of warning signs in the back of my head, you know, that might have been going off and flashing there. But I knew Steve, he was also a chaplain in the Air Guard. And I knew at that point in his life and his career in the Air Guard, he was doing a lot of tours overseas. So I knew it was a possibility he could be over there. So I thought, well, I'm going to bring somebody else in here that will set me straight, you know, and, and stuff like that. So I called Melinda in. <laughs> I had her start to read it, you know, and the next thing you know, I hear this upside to my head, you know, I was like, are you serious? Gee, many Christmas, you know, it's a scam. And I'm like, no, this is Pete, you know, and, and but I also knew at that time more, you know, with the pain back there, more and more si lights are, are starting to flash that he was the uh, uh, the pastor at the Methodist Church in Fort Dodge, Iowa. So I call him up. I say, hey, is Pastor Pete there? Yeah, he's in a meeting right now. Oh, okay, everything comes, you know, boom, and I'm having to deal with reality. Someone's trying to scam me, you know? And I tell Pete, he comes out, tell him what's going on. He says, get as much information from this person as you can and let me know. And I'm like, no problem, you know, and, and stuff like that. So I'm like, hey, how can I help you? And he's like, oh, I need you to send, I think, $850. That'll get me back to the U.S. Oh, cool. Where do I need to send it to, Pete? I'll send it right away, you know? And, and okay, the preacher was lying, but I'll send it right away, you know, and, and uh, hurry up today and all this kind of stuff and they so he sends me this account number uh or she or whoever they are send me an account number to send the money to and i was like hey can the military help no hey what about your wife sue man i never heard back from you know so i gave the information to steve but here's what i learned about myself and maybe you already know this to be true too it's, it's hard to see the warning signs when you don't want to see the warning signs you know I, 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 scams like that work because people just don't want to believe it i mean other folks can see it for what it is like I said, I was just two, three sentences into it, and some of you were smiling and nudging, nudging the prayer, and you already knew what I was telling you. The story was a scam, but when I lived it, it wasn't. You, you, you know, you want something to be so desperately true that you refuse to acknowledge what is obvious, that so many other people can see the truth. So that's why denial is a refusal to acknowledge, to acknowledge the warning signs. And we see this again happening in people's lives all the time. People, you know, stars and everything that we know, one of the most... Um, famous sports athletes that we saw happen of course was tiger Woods several years ago tiger got caught up in all the affairs that he was having and he very first started to kind of go into a little bit of of you know no but i you know i'll give him some credit he stood up and and you know there at the end and went before the news and confessed it all and said it it was but listen how he talks about denial he doesn't use the word denial but you can hear it here when he said this in his news conference I know my actions were wrong, but I convinced myself that normal rules don't apply to me. I never thought about who I was hurting. I thought I could get away with whatever I wanted to. That's denial. It's obvious to you. It's obvious to me. It's obvious to everyone else. But when you don't change, when, when you don't want to acknowledge the warning signs because of how it's going to affect your life, you're in denial. You're in denial. A another 
uh, area that Eli shows a common response to God is, is when Eli says this, or when it says this about Eli, and Eli did nothing to stop them. He sees the warning signs, he knows about it, but he did nothing to stop them. That's called passivity or being passive. See, here's, here's what we do. We see God's warning lights and we just say, well, I'm not going to do anything because, well, I'm sure everything will work out. Everything will be fine, you know, and we become passive. And one of the reasons we become passive is because we know just how bad things might get if we actually address it. And it seems like I'm going to be happier if I, I mean, I might be feeling a little uncomfortable in this situation right now, but I know if I go deal with these warning lights right now, it could be a lot. So I'm just going to stay in my uncomfortable zone. And so that's what we do. We stay passive. We see studies in, like this happen, not, not just in our spiritual, we see it happen all the time. People get passive with things that need to be serious. I mean, there'll be somebody that has, you know, uh, uh, and, and cancer. Cancer runs in their family really, really bad. And, you know, they refuse to go get treated. Why? Because if I don't get treated, you know, I won't get cancer. I mean, not treated, but tested. Excuse me, use the wrong word there. I'm not going to go get tested to find out if I, if I don't get tested, you know, then hey, I'll never get cancer, right? That's the denial. That's being passive. That's refusing to, to look at the truth of what it might be in our lives. And we think doing nothing is the best. But when there's a fire right there, even if it's a small fire, it doesn't take much wind. It doesn't take much fuel to get that fire to go into a raging flame that can destroy and I think there's some, some cues, some clues that why Eli was, you know, the way that he was, why he had these responses. Because, well, the first one is this. When, when you take a look, when Samuel comes to Eli and he tells him these things that are going to happen to him, what's going to happen to his family and his future family, listen how Eli responds. He says this, he's the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. Let him do whatever he thinks is best. Again, he just found out his family and his future family is going to experience these long-term consequences and his response is, well, God is God, let him do what he thinks is best. Now, for some of us, we might think, well, that's, that's a pretty mature spiritual response. That has nothing to do with being spiritual in this situation. That is 100% being passive as far as how we respond to God when God gives us a warning when we see these lights that are there. He's, being, he's in denial. He's being passive about doing anything about it. I mean, you can look through Scripture and see example after example after example where God gives these warnings, some pretty hard warnings like Nineveh. Remember, God comes and says, I'm going to destroy all of Nineveh. The king of Nineveh finds out that God's going to wipe out Nineveh off this earth and it's not going to be. And, and, and the king of Nineveh realizes what needs to happen and he comes to his people and this is what he says. There's going to be a fast in our whole nation. No living creature will eat a single thing. Who knows? God may yet relent and not bring upon us the destruction that he has warned us about. So Jonah goes on talking there and, 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 and describing, and he gets frustrated, but he goes on describing, when God saw how the king and how all of the Ninevites responded, how their hearts changed, how they stopped their action, how they were truly repentant, when God saw all that, he had compassion and he pulled away his wrath. Now, which response is more spiritual, the king of Nineveh or Eli's? Yeah, it's God. God will do what he wants to do anyhow. Well, okay. It's God. God will do what God wants to do anyhow. But what's our response? See, I, I think one of the things in the church today that we've forgotten, one of the things that we forget sometimes in the church that, that you know, when it comes to our life and these warning signs, God is looking for men, women, people of all ages that are willing to say, I'm broken. I'm broken. You know, I need to get on my knees. I need to be willing to get on my knees and say, God, my way was wrong. And once again, no surprise to me, your way, your way is right. And I'm sorry for trying to do it my way. It should be your way. And so God, I want to surrender to your way. God, please have mercy on me. God, please have forgiveness on me, on my family, for whatever. God, please, I cry out to you. To me, I think that's what God's looking for from the heart of the people. And a lot, not a, well, it's God, he can do what he wants. But I think another clue as to why he was acting the ways that he acted is when God asked him a question there 
in chapter 2, verse 29, God said to him, why do you honor your sons more than me? Remember that question? Why do you honor your sons more than you honor me, Eli? Basically, Eli, he says, look it, I'm warning you about your kids. They're doing wrong. You need to take action. And he doesn't do anything. And so what he says to God is, I'm honoring my sons. I'm placing my sons above you. I'm honoring my sons more than I'm honoring you. And my friends, essentially, that's what we do. When these lights are flashing, when the Holy Spirit brings that truth before us, those warning signs are there, whatever it is, God looks at you and says, man, you're a workaholic. And you need to realize, and you, know, and you don't do anything. Here's these, you're saying, I'm honoring my job, my work, more than I'm honoring you. Whatever it is, you can place it there. When God looks at you, you know, and all those struggles. Because when, we, when we're passive about a certain area, about a certain person, it reveals that we're honoring that area or that person more than we are honoring God himself. And so what are we honoring? Who are we honoring? Maybe more than we're honoring God. But I think the number one reason why Eli probably was in denial and so passive and, and, and all those kinds of things we're learning about today is also what was said there in verse 22. By this time, Eli was very old. By this time, Eli was very old. He probably thought, it's just, it's too late. I mean, that's a common response I hear when I talk to a lot of people, you know? And they'll say, yeah, I understand what's being said. I understand what the sermon said. I understand what God's saying in his word, but it's too late for me to do anything now. And I hear this. It's not just old people. I hear this, I think, from people of all ages. You know, you see the warning signs in their life. They see the warning signs in their life. And they've been aware of them maybe for a couple months or a couple years. And they're like, what should I do now? It's too late. You know, if, if I would have had that message a month ago, a year ago, 20 years ago, but now the house is already burned down. So people will come to me and say, Dave, hey, my kids are too old for me to do anything with them. My marriage is too broken. My debt is too overwhelming. My friends are way too angry at me. My reputation is way too shot. My addictions are way too powerful. My relationship with God is just way too cold. It's not that I don't agree with what I heard being taught at small group or from that sermon or on the radio or when I sat down in my quiet time and read the Bible. It's not that I don't agree. It's not that I don't want to take action, but what am I supposed to do? It's too late. And on one hand, I completely understand why those feelings are there and why those words have been said because I've spoken them and felt that way myself. So I understand on one hand, but on the other hand, what I say and what needs to be said and what we need to remember is, okay, I might feel that way on this side, but it's never too late for Christ. It's never too late for God. That's the whole thing that we just celebrated about Easter. That was the whole purpose behind Easter, helping us understand that we have a resurrected Savior, a resurrected Lord that is there and, and wants to be there and will be there and can empower and guide and lead and direct and help us within our life. I might feel like it's too late, but it's never too late for Christ. I think that's one of my favorite things about God. He's a redeeming God. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose, you know? It doesn't mean that there's not pain. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But he can redeem. It's never too late for God, all right? You might feel like it's too late for you, but it's never too late for God. And if you're in a place where you feel like it's too late, we're getting ready to come before these emblems. And we're going to give thanks, and we're going to celebrate. We're going to take in the two cups, we're going to go back and we're going to give thanks for a God that does love us, a God that has prepared a way, a God that is willing to warn us within our life and, and try to make sure that we're staying on the path and understand the life that he created us to live and to fulfill that purpose. If you're at that place though right now where maybe you feel like it's too late, I just missed an opportunity, or maybe you know somebody that said those words and you can take this truth and share with them, but if that's where you are, there's a story in Scripture, and the story in Scripture is this. There is a Redeemer, and His name is Jesus Christ. And you can't, but He can. You can't see, but He knows. All right? And if there's some warning signs in your life right now, if you can kind of maybe see the smoke in the distance, smell the smoke, see the smoke, maybe see some ashes even fall, maybe you're looking at the little fire burning right down there. I don't know where that is, and I, I want to encourage you today to do something. I want to encourage you to take action today, not tomorrow. If you're hearing that truth spoken to you today by God's word, that's not me. That's the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit never says tomorrow. Today's that day. 
he brought you or he allowed you to tune in online or whatever that is so you could hear this truth, so you could take action today. I want to encourage you to take that action today. Call that person, whatever that is. Get that accountability, whatever that is. But the second thing I want to tag on to that is don't do that alone. You got a family, a family here that wants to walk through this journey of life with you. I'm going to do something I haven't done in a while is when we get done praying here for communion, I'm going to be down front. And if there are people that you want us to be praying for, if you need prayer, if there's decisions you want to make in that, then come on down here with me. If people are with me, we have other leadership that are willing to be here and to pray with you so we can make sure, you know, that we're taking action today so God's truth can come into our life. And God can be there in our lives. We can be on that journey. We can listen to those warning signs and we can reset them, as they say, get those cleared, get those dealt with and go on to the life that God wants us to have. Amen. Let's pray before him right now. Go before him. Father, thanks so much for that truth. Thanks so much that when you created us, Lord, and you made that way, you became that redeemer. You became that savior. Heavenly Father, thank you, Father God, that you didn't leave us on our own, but Father, you are concerned. And you give us signs, you give us signals and and everything. And Father God, you have a life, a purpose you want us to live. Father God, in a direction you want us to go. And Father, you help us to know when we're starting to to, to waver from that. And I thank you for that truth and what that means to us. And so Father, forgive us for the times that we have missed those. Forgive us for those times that we have seen those and ignored those for whatever reason. Forgive us when we've just done like what we've learned how Eli did within his life. We can all relate so many ways. But Father, as we come before these elements, we praise you for being a God that provided a way, not just with your son so many years ago that is such a massive blessing, but Father, still today, Lord, help us to hear the truth you're speaking to us now and to step up, Father, and if there's action that needs to be taken, to take that action today, Father God. Thanks so much for that kind of grace, that kind of mercy, that kind of love in our life. Amen.
picked up all my pieces. You put me back together. 